knowing and sharing Christ's unsurpassable love. Let's join Pastor Ed for today's study. Turn our way through the Bible verse by verse this morning, verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety or a guarantee of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests of Aaron because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for himself, for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appointed as high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, we want to understand your word, so we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive from you. Speak to us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. <clears throat> so this section of Scripture talks about the priorities of eternity, what's really important. I love the old story about the, uh, the man who was a, a miser, hard worker, but really stingy, and he kept every penny he could and squeezed it for all it was worth. And, but finally, he came towards the end of his life, and he called his wife in, who was a Christian believer, and, and he said, uh, sweetheart, I need for you to promise me something. She said, okay, if I can do it. And he said, yeah, I want you to promise that you put all my money in the casket with me when I die so I can have it in the hereafter. And she said, okay, if that's what you want. He said, I do. So sure enough, he died a couple days later. And at the funeral, about a week later, she was sitting with her best friend. They're both in black. And, uh, and the whole thing goes on, uh, the funeral. And at the end of it, uh, she walks up and she slips a little box inside the casket right before they closed it. And when she came back, her friend grabbed her arm and she said, you didn't give all that money to that old stingy man, did you? And she said, well, you know, I'm a believer and I made a promise. She said, I can't believe it. You put all that money in there? She said, well, yes, I did. I wrote him a check and put it in there. Just helping you ladies along in the future, <laughs> should it come up. So we are looking uh, with privilege this morning at what some people have called uh, the greatest scripture in the New Testament. Some see it as uh, even stronger than the one most people think of, John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him would have eternal life. But this one is more sweeping because it talks about repentance and God's ability that he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. That God is both able and willing to save anyone who would come completely, totally. Now the word uttermost is an interesting one. Um, there was an American evangelist who had been a pro baseball player. His name was Billy Sunday, great name for an evangelist. And uh, he played professional ball for a number of years. He was very good, very fast on the bases. And, but he also uh, was drinking with his buddies often. And one day he fell, tripped over a curb, and fell in the gutter. And that became uh, the moment that he remembers and started seeking God. So when he became a pastor and an evangelist, he began to preach on this verse quite often. Only he changed the, the one word, uttermost. He changed it to guttermost. 
that God would save to the guttermost those who come. He'll even chase you into a gutter. I don't know what kind of gutter you might be in this morning, but if you're here because you're looking for God, you're in the right place because he's here. He's in our midst right now, and he's willing and able and desiring to save any who would come to him. So this uh, section of scripture we're looking at is one that has been uh, taught by many Probably hundreds of thousands of, of sermons have been given on this particular verse and the verses around it. It's embedded in a, a letter written to Hebrew Christians, people who had been Jewish, had grown up as Jews, and then received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, their Mashiach. It's about 67 AD, which makes it a very unusual time. Jesus uh, had died on a cross in 32, 33, and it's uh, about 25 years later, and the Roman Empire is still intact, and so is the temple. Even though the temple veil was split in two when Jesus died on the cross and the ground was rent, the next day Judaism went on. And so even as they received this letter up in a suburb of Rome, uh, these Jews who were struggling, uh, the temple was still doing all the things the temple normally does. And that's just the background for uh, what's going on in this section, that there were priests, Jewish priests, still in the temple, nine o'clock in the morning they'd offer a sacrifice, three o'clock in the afternoon they'd offer a sacrifice, the morning and evening sacrifices, every feast day, uh, every Sabbath, there was this constant organization that was continuing, even though it had been abolished, even though the old covenant was no longer in place. But something also is taking place at this time. Rome begins to persecute Christians. Nero had torched Rome. He wanted to rebuild a new city. And when the people weren't real excited about that, he blamed the Christians for it. And that started persecution of Christians. So these Jews who are living in a suburb of Rome who had received Jesus as their Messiah, all of a sudden they're stuck. And when the Jewish friends at the synagogue were doing fine, they were being kicked out of the synagogue. And that's where all the schools and the unions, the guilds took place. So it was putting an economic hardship on them but there was also the possibility of martyrdom because Christians were being burned to death in Rome, in Nero's gardens. So they're starting to waver in their faith. And some of them are wanting to go back to the Old Covenant, to the Old Testament laws. Because if you were a Jew, you weren't being persecuted. If you were a Christian, you are. Well, it's the same thing, right? The temple's still going on, same God. No, it's not God has a new covenant, and you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Jesus taught quite a bit about it. I hope you took communion. You remember that night when Jesus took the cup, he said, this is my blood of a new covenant, a new testament, a new agreement. That comes up in this section of scripture too. So this particular section breaks up into three parts. God's oath to make Jesus a priest forever, 20 through 22. The permanence for us on our behalf that he remains a priest forever. And then his perfect sacrifice of himself was so perfect, 26 through 28, that no longer would any sacrifice need to be done for our sins. Pretty sweeping area of scripture, some important concepts, theological ideas here. And uh, they continue down even to this day. That, yes, there was uh, a number of things that they didn't understand yet in Rome. In fact, if you were with us, you'll remember that the writers said, you, you're not growing. You're staying still. In fact, some of you are going backwards. And so you have to be given spiritual milk instead of solid food. You're like a baby. What's the solid food? The things that he's teaching now here in this section. That not only did Jesus die once and for all for our sins, but that he right now, here, this morning, 
is interceding for you and for me. That he's intervening with Father God. So there's some really big thoughts here. Uh, Let's jump in and see what God might say to all of us. Starting in verse 20, God's oath. And inasmuch as he, Jesus, was not made priest without a note. Something is unusual about this priest, besides him being God the Son, but that when God said he was going to be a priest forever, he swore on himself. It's kind of a strange thought. But if we're in a court of law and you're asked to go to the witness stand, you put your hand on the Bible, you said, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But when God swears, he can't swear on anything higher than himself. By the act of putting your hand on the Bible, you're saying, "Uh, this is truth, and I'm going to do the same. God says, I'll swear by myself. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, greater than anything. And he swore by this verse, uh, the next verse, verse 21, this oath. For they have become priests without an oath, they being the Levitical priests, the priests that are down in Jerusalem offering sacrifices every day as this letter was being read. They became priests without an oath, but he, capital H, with an oath by he, capital him, capital H, who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are priests forever according to the order of Melchizedek. God himself has sworn, taken an oath is the point. Now, this verse appears numerous times in this letter. It actually is taken from Psalm 110, verse 4. And that's important because he says a couple of things about it later that are unusual. But the point is God the Father is saying to God the Son, you are a certain kind of priest, different than the Levitical priests, like Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is this mysterious priest who was in Salem, where Jerusalem would go, when Abraham went through, uh, which was 2000 B.C., okay? And if if you read the chapter before this, the first part of chapter 7, there's a a discussion about Melchizedek. If you weren't here, you need to go get the CD or go online and listen to it because uh, it's an astounding picture of Jesus, and it was said in 1,000 B.C., so it was said 1,000 years before Jesus came and became that high priest. Okay, we won't go back there completely, but priest means bridge builder. Jesus is the bridge builder between us and Father God. He did it by the great exchange, by dying in your place, dying in my place the wonder of it all. And when we draw near to him, as he said to, we looked at last time, he will draw near to us. He will draw us in. So he's the bridge. Verse 22, by which or by so much more, Jesus has become a surety, old English word, uh, guarantee of a better covenant, of a better agreement between God and man. Jesus is the guarantee that God is keeping this new covenant onto eternity. So some translations say a bond, like you put up a bond, a bail bond maybe, something like that, or that you would co-sign on a loan. But really guarantee is the clearest picture. Now, We have something in America that I haven't found anywhere else in the world uh, that uses the word money back guarantee, that uh, it's supposed to help us make a commitment to buy, and it normally does. Uh, I don't like to use it, but if I know that if the thing doesn't work for me or breaks or something, I can take it back and get my money back kind of a thing. But uh, sometimes those guarantees don't work very good. Like, I don't know the last time you bought an airline ticket, but if you show up uh, 15 minutes before the flight, you're probably not going to get on the airline because they overbook flights routinely now. And even though it's guaranteed, it's not guaranteed you'll fly that day. (laughs) It's guaranteed that someday they'll make a seat available to you. Uh, So guarantees uh, have a little bit of uh, play in them, I guess you could say. So when we talk about a guarantee of heaven, this covenant that has to do with eternity, 
We're talking about something that's very critical. In fact, it could be argued the most critical guarantee in all of the universe, in all of time. In other words, you don't want to show up at heaven and say, Hi, I'm Ed, I want to come in, and then looking through the books, and you notice they're taking a long time, and they're going through the books, and they said, You know, we can't seem to find your name here. Um, when did you book your reservation? <laughs> Well, you need to know that you have booked your reservation. And it's simply us humbling ourselves before God and surrendering to him. We'll come back to that. But guarantees are very important. Of a better covenant. So guarantee is an important word. Covenant is an important word. Very important word. Um, The New Testament in the Bible is the new covenant on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And it was an agreement made with Jews on Mount Sinai. And uh, it has now become, we'll see next week, obsolete. That Jesus said there's a new covenant. And when he said this is my blood of a new covenant, he meant in a matter of hours the old one would be gone. And this new relationship based upon... God giving his life for my life and each one of us that, yeah, amen, that we uh, would spend eternity with him. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning because it's the next chapter, really. But at least I want you to see that this concept is a very important. It is a better covenant because it is unconditional and it is final and you could argue irreversible. Uh, The covenant of unconditional blessings, someone has called it. Jesus spoke about it in Mark 14, Matthew 26, and Luke 22. And here, and then in Jeremiah 31. It's also in Ezekiel 36, God predicting that it was coming hundreds of years before it came. Here's the way he said it in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart. Sound familiar? And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will pour out my spirit, put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my ways, in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments, and you will do them. What God is saying is that he gives us his will, his desire. And that when we surrender to him... That becomes a part of us, and it starts a slow but predictable change in us, that he changes our desires, and we find ourselves actually desiring to do the things that he wants us to do. It's a process. It doesn't happen instantaneously, but it is a promise that we will want to do what he wants us to do. He will show us. It will happen. We'll look at that more closely next time. Verse 23. Also, there were many priests, still alive at that time, because they were prevented by death from continuing. All the high priests in the past all died, which was the good news and the bad news. Uh, If they were a good high priest, then everyone was sad. But there were plenty of bad high priests. You'll remember the two that were in place, which was unheard of, during Jesus' day. Both of them corrupt. Ananias and this uh, high priest that even the Romans thought was too crooked to keep in there. And so uh, they replaced him. So uh, high priests come and go are the point. And uh, death ends their lives. Uh, Verse 23 is saying another difference between the priesthood is that the old priesthood died off, but the new one does not. So he's building this case for Jesus being permanent, verse 24. And he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. You don't have to worry about Jesus being replaced, all right? He's got job security for you and for me. He ended the weaknesses of men's failures, verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the guttermost or uttermost, depending on your background, those who come to God through him, since he always lives, to make intercession for them. 
Therefore, he is able once and forever to save everyone who comes to God through Jesus. He lives forever to plead with God on their behalf. That's the New Living Testament. Okay, he is able. This is one of those great little phrases in Scripture. It talks about God's capacity, his capability, actually his desire too. Uh, a statement of how great God's forgiveness really is towards you and towards me. This is the good news. NIV says he is able to save completely those who come to God. The idea is of absolute confidence in what God said that it will happen. I'm not sure that's happening in most of the church in America today. I'm not sure if you asked the majority of evangelical Christians if they believed that every word of the Bible was true. I think people, most people hedge their bets on that. But this is one you want to be all in on. This is God is able. God is able. You're not. I'm not. But God is able. He's able to get us into eternity. I wrote down four here. There's a lot of them. Jude 124, God is able. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to prevent you faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able to keep me, to keep you from falling, blowing it, blowing up your life, fragmenting it after you've surrendered to him. He is able to do it. Not to say that we don't have to call out to him, but it's real simple. Just say his name. Just say Jesus. Whew. I feel that when I say that because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven by which a person might be saved. You don't have to yell it in the middle of your office <laughs> at work. You don't have to scream it in the cafeteria school. You can say it quietly. God's not deaf. <laughs> but calling on his name always brings help. God is able. He is able to keep you from stumbling. God is also able to strengthen us. Listen to Hebrews 2.18 again. We looked at it a while back. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. God is able to come alongside and make a way of escape. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. He said that no person is tempted above their ability to resist, but God is able to make a way of escape. He'll give you one. It might be a diversion. It might be a, just somebody that comes up and asks you a question to get your mind off it. But God is able to change your circumstances and strengthen us. Thirdly, God is able... To be sufficient for us. That's a great verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make grace abound towards you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance of every good work. God is able to make all grace abound. Grace is a gift. Grace is God's favor towards you towards me, that we don't deserve. The word charis means gift. So God gives you the, the gift of grace, and it's a big gift. He is saying that he is able to give you grace that you can't contain it so much. That's a reoccurring theme again in the New Testament, Romans 5.17b. God is giving grace. And he said, those who receive his gift of righteousness and his abounding grace shall reign through the one Christ Jesus. If I will receive, open myself up to take in God's grace and his righteousness, I will reign in life. Circumstances won't compress me. I'll be able to stand. You will be able to stand if you will increase your capacity to hold God's grace. What he's saying is abounding grace is more grace than I can contain, than you can contain. We're containers for grace. 
God is giving grace, and we've run out of room for it. So how do you increase it? You give away all the grace that he's given you to other people, and then your capacity increases. God is giving you more grace than you can handle. He's blessing your life in a thousand ways. We'll come again to that in just a moment. But he is graceful towards you. How much? 320. Now to him, uh, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God wants to give you grace so much, it's beyond what you could even guess he'll do. It's stunning. It's surprising. Exceedingly abundantly. You ask for something small and God gives you more. Why? Because we deserve it? No, because he's our dad. And our dad loves us. He is able to save to the uttermost. Save. Save. What's save? Somebody asked me that the other day. What do you mean when you say save? Well, save, the Greek word zozo, S-O-Z-O or S-O-D-Z-O, depending on how you transliterate, it means completeness. It means wholeness. It means to be delivered, to be protected, to be healed, and to be preserved. Delivered from difficulties. Something's happening beyond what you can control. And God is able to deliver you from it. Get you out of that situation that you can't handle, but he can. He's protecting you. He keeps us out of harm's way. He makes sure that we are safe. He heals us. (laughs) to uh, make us well, whole, complete, to become all we're supposed to be, that he plans for us, he preserves us, so we won't fall back. He's able to save completely all the way into eternity. This phrase is filled with meaning, to save to the uttermost. NSB says, uh, able to save forever. RSV says, able to save all the time. NIV is able to save completely. Living Bible, able to save down to the very end. God has it all handled. He's taking care of you. He's taking care of me. To the uttermost, completely again. Those who come to God through him, who come to Father God through Jesus the Son. That in fact, God gives us forgiveness. This is really talking about that concept of being coming to him in repentance. Those who come to God say, Lord, forgive me. Since he always lives to make intercession, the word means is to intervene. Jesus is intervening on your behalf right now. Well, pastor, I'm doing fine. Mm. <laughs> it's awkward because God reads our heart. <laughs> You may be sitting here with your hands folded and so you really can't do too much bad, you know, like when we were in third grade. Fold your hands and put them on the top of the desk or otherwise I'm going to kill you little monsters. None of our teachers, of course, would say that, but they're, that's, we think we're safe, right? Because we're not doing anything overt right now. No, no, Jesus said it happens up here and it happens here. That if I've done it in my heart, I may as well have done it physically. But he is able, when we come to him, to make intercession for us to Father God. We'll come back to that again at the end. 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us what we needed, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So he's the kind of high priest we need because he is holy. And and this... Greek word for holy is unusual. It only appears three times in the New Testament. The other words for holy appears 30 times. This one is only used to describe deity, to describe God. And it means precisely what is needed. Jesus is precisely what you need. It almost sounds ridiculous to say it. It's exactly what we need. He is the perfect person to meet our needs. Because his person and his sacrifice are without spot, wrinkle. Everything's perfect. He's harmless, blameless, the NIV says. Um, guileless. The idea is without any malice or evil thoughts towards you. God is for you. He is not against us. He is, in fact, doing everything he can 
to get us there. Listen, Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us, get this, all things, everything we need? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? You. It is God who justifies. Who is he who tries to condemn? It is Christ who died and furthermore also risen, who is even at the right hand of Father God, who makes intercession for us. There it is, Romans 8, again. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or illness or bills or a bad boss at work? <laughs> No one can separate us from the love of God. This is great stuff. No evil intent. He wants to bless us. This is a difficult concept to com convince people of. But listen to what Jesus said about that. Acts 3.27 To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize they don't have any spiritual resources except those things that God has given them. Blessed are you who mourn. Repent over your sin. Blessed are the meek. Humble before the creator of the universe. Who wouldn't be when you understand who he is. Blessed are you if you hunger and thirst after rightness before God. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed when they revile you. Blessed when they persecute you. Everywhere Jesus took children, it says, and he blessed them. How about Matthew 14, 14? You shall be blessed, for they cannot repay you when you help someone. Matthew 24, 50. He lifted up his hand and he blessed the people. Luke 24, 45, last words before he left his disciples. He said, Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, and then he blessed them, and he left. Somebody said this to me. I had to write it down two weeks ago. I can understand how the Lord would bless children or new converts or even Christians in poor countries who need miracles just to survive. I can see how he would bless imprisoned believers in foreign countries, but I can't believe those kinds of blessings for myself. I just don't think I ever live up to the light that I have received. I feel God is mostly displeased with me. I don't feel worthy of his blessings. My response, you're not worthy. None of us are. It's not based on worthy. It's based on grace. It's based on this gift, this abounding grace that he's trying to give to us. That's how he blesses you. He gives you favor with him in front of him and in front of other people. God makes you look good. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I got a yes. I, I, you know, we're not a Pentecostal church, but every once in a while you could you know, let a, a <laughs> amen come out of I wouldn't be offended, you know. It would be okay. Separated from sinners. Set apart, literally it means. Jesus was accused of hanging out with sinners. It's not talking about that. He's saying that there's no room for sin in his life. He was absolutely perfect. But, you know, he'd have lunch with tax collectors and prostitutes and was the talk of the neighborhood because he was around them. Undefiled, free from contamination, separated, set apart. Um, verse 27 it continues, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. This is a pretty sweeping, important theological concept. So again, it's 67. The temple is opened every morning 
And at 9 o'clock in the morning, they do a sacrifice, the morning offering for the sins of the people. But before it, the high or the priest who's doing it has to make a sacrifice for his own sins because he was imperfect. And then at three in the afternoon, the same thing happens again. And then every feast day and every Sabbath. So all these sacrifices are going on. But every time a priest walks up to sacrifice, he first has to sacrifice for himself before he can build a bridge, stand in between. Not true with Jesus. He did it once and for all. Once and for all. Jesus died once and for all, and there will never be a need for a sacrifice again. Yeah, it's just that simple. Last verse. For the law appointed as high priests, men who have weaknesses, who were sinners. But the word of the oath that God said in Psalm 110 verse 4, which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Okay, you got to think in time here a moment. So the law is about 1600 uh, B.C., and David is about 1,000 B.C. There's 600, 500, to 600 years in between. Psalm 110 was w- written 500 years after the law was in place, which came after the law, this declaration, this oath from God that Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek and appoints a son who has been already perfect forever, always has been. He always existed. I know, it's a mind bender. God has always existed, and he is able to save us because he is perfected. Verse 25, this important verse, we'll close on this. Therefore, he is also able to save to the utter or guttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. Able to save. What do I mean when I say save? Somebody asked me that not long ago. What do you mean? Saved from what? Who needs salvation? That's an important question. Salvation is a very radical word. To be saved is a sweeping statement. No one needs salvation who is doing fine, who thinks they're doing fine, who thinks, well, you know, my life is pretty together. Yeah, I might add a couple things to make it absolutely perfect, but, but I've got it. I've got this thing called life. You will never come and ask for help from Jesus until you recognize your own need, your own inability to live the life that he wants you to have. So who is it that needs to be saved? A person who recognizes their life is not going the way it should. Just that simple. That they recognize their need for God's involvement in their lives is someone who can't save themselves. Someone who will not survive without someone else helping them. A people who have recognized that they would die without intervention. I, I've been kind of watching uh, Mount Everest in Nepal uh, since being there uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. And uh, I understand a little bit better what's going on. So we have these hundreds of tourist climbers and the uh, Sherpas uh, just cringe. Uh, people who just want to come and, and climb the mountain. And they're wearing, you know, boots from Tom McCann and a T-shirt and have a water bottle with them. <laughs> they need to be saved. <laughs> but in a serious way... Some even who have the right equipment are not prepared to recognize their complete need. Six people have died so far this year again on Mount Everest. People who didn't know that they needed to be saved until they had fallen. And five of the six were still conscious when they found them and tried to helicopter them out. But all six of them died. They had saved dozens of others. But they needed to be saved. They needed someone to intervene. 1881, March 6th, north in Scotland, there was a huge storm. And a three-masted schooner was driven up on the rocks. And the fishermen from the local village tried to go out and help remove the 11 men from it. And they were caught in 30-foot waves. And the 
ship was going to break up. They couldn't get to him, so they finally were able to float out a, a giant rope, and they caught it on the ship, and they pulled it up, brought another rope along it, and they took literally a wooden cask, and uh, they used it as the lorry, a way to bring people back and forth. First young man got him. He was the sickest of them, and they brought him to the shore. He was saved. Ten people left on the ship. But as soon as he got out of the barrel, the, uh, a wave hit the back of the ship and spun it around so all the ropes were entangled in the rigging, and there was no way to do it again. So a young man climbed up on the edge and jumped in and tried to swim. And uh, huge waves coming over him. He had a hold of the rope and just trying to swim along the rope, thought he could make it, but he didn't. Huge waves over him, finally pulled him off the rope, and he drowned. Everybody's just standing there. They couldn't do anything to get in the water. They'd have drowned with him. But as soon as he went under, another huge wave hit the ship and spun it back around in the right direction. And all nine men came off the ship. Well, they asked the captain what happened that this young man left. And he said, uh, quote, the best man in the crew, but he was lost because he tried to save himself. In his own way, yes, all the rest were saved, but by other hands than their own. Human powers are wholly inadequate to save someone in this situation. To rely on them is to ensure disaster. God is waiting for anyone, everyone, who will just simply say, I need you, Lord. I surrender. If you haven't done that, don't leave this morning until you do. Would you stand, please? And we'll pray together. This message is brought to you with a desire for you to know and grow in Christ's unsurpassable love. We want to encourage you to follow His plan for your life. Oh, great moment, form and function, careless consumerist consumption, 